What if at the center of your every day, you place communion with the God who personifies love? I mean, what if the waking thoughts of your day were spent dreaming with God, dreams as big as kingdom come and as ordinary as daily bread? And what if you slipped away at midday for a few minutes or a few seconds because every other force is vying for your attention but only Jesus has your heart? And what if he could remind you mid-work day of who you are and of what you're tempted to forget in, in, in a world of such contested space and so many other voices? And what if you spent your commute home uh, or the final moments of your day before you fell asleep recounting both the magnificent and the minuscule ways that you encountered God's blessing in the last 24 hours? What if your day belonged to the God who loves you without needing to control you? The God whose chief concern is your deepest well-being, the God who's gently, gently forming you into the best image of yourself and who breathes into your exhaustion with abundant life. What if fidelity to Jesus is everything and the way you choose it is as simple as prayer? This is not an invitation to a more disciplined, rote, ritualistic prayer life. It is a quiet rebellion. It is a free choice to live my life by a different order of loves to choose Jesus at the center. So how do we live that? How do we put this into practice? Through the Bridgetown Daily Prayer Rhythm. So beginning today and then moving forward as core of the life of Bridgetown Church is a vision for fidelity. It is ordering your life individually and our life communally according to a three-part daily prayer rhythm that was based on the early church and, and in which gives birth to both love and power. First, in the morning, pray the Lord's Prayer. Start your day with God. That simple practice is not about discipline or personality type, it's about love. I am yet to find a single man or woman of faith who made a significant dent for the kingdom of God throughout history who didn't spend the waking moments of their every day with God. Mark chapter one says, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. As a 14-year-old kid, I remember reading that verse and it just awoke the simplest of longings within me. I want to pray like Jesus prayed. And so what I would do is every night before I fell asleep, I would set my alarm 15 minutes earlier than I had to to get to school on time, just 15 minutes. And then I would open my Bible to Mark chapter one and I would lay it on top of my alarm clock. So that the next morning when my alarm went up, eh, 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 you know, when that happened and all of my adolescent instincts took over and my right hand just swept across to hit the snooze button on the alarm clock, my hand would fall right on top of the Bible and I would remember then Jesus awoke early in the morning long before daybreak and went off into the wilderness to pray. Because beneath my surface level desire for a few more minutes of sleep was this deeper desire to know the Father like Jesus did. And if you want the life of Jesus, you have to take on the lifestyle of Jesus. So I began totally imperfectly and in fits and starts as a 14 year old kid to try to start my day like Jesus did. And that simple habit was the beginning of a life of prayer that became so deeply personal and wildly adventurous and wondrously awe inducing that I'm still living in it today. So whatever your morning routine is right now, I just wanna simply suggest a, a new ambition or adjustment or addition, pray like Jesus taught us. Every morning pray the Lord's Prayer. Jesus' instructive prayer found in Matthew 6 and 11 is a way that we are 100% sure that the early church prayed liturgically. And when I say pray the Lord's Prayer, I do not mean recite it from memory. I mean allow those words to thematically guide you through movements of prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So stop there and just remember the God that you're talking to before you proceed to the next thing. God is the one who is relentless in love, the one whose mercy outruns anger, the one who's victorious in this world so that I can live without fear. He is my Father who knows me by grace, and he is our Father who makes those that I interact with today more than stranger or neighbor, but brother and sister. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then begin to think about friends outside of relationship with Jesus, systems or, uh, of injustice or individuals in need of mercy. Anywhere and everywhere you can think of God's kingdom of love and peace is lacking, ask for it to come. I could keep on going like this, but you get it. Allow each line to send you into a theme of prayer. 
And then at midday, pray for the lost. I'd love if you just indulge me for a moment and close your eyes and just try to go imaginatively to this place with me. I want you to picture yourself mid-workday, whether for you that means sitting at a desk or driving a truck or running an open house or caring for patients or calming a classroom or raising children. Just picture yourself there at the midpoint of your day. And now you escape the workflow of the workday for just a minute or two. It could be for a moment of contemplative silence at your desk or a walk around the block outside your office building or just an escape into that one holy stall in the restroom. But you're escaping because you know a secret. You know the secret that this kingdom that everyone else is so feverishly building, willing their bodies and brains into a few more hours of productive focus, it isn't the one that will stand. It isn't the one that will last forever. You steal away for a couple minutes because you know that secret. But you also steal away because you have to. You have to or else you will forget that secret. You will start believing the same subtle lie that this small temporary kingdom is the ultimate one and that you are the sum total of your doing and producing. So you need to redirect your affections, your thoughts, your labor, the very center of your being so that you keep eternity in focus. So as you come back to me, I just wonder how you would live differently if right at the midpoint of every day you stopped to pray, Jesus, you're the good shepherd who leaves the 99 to go after the one. Jesus, let my heart be broken for what yours is broken for and my life overflow with your compassion. Jesus, I pray to you for Sam and Lynn and Jamal and Sanvi that you would go in pursuit of them and Jesus, would you send me in response to my own prayers. How might that alter your afternoon? How might that, over the course of weeks or months, begin to shift your heart and attention? How might it change the people that you're passing your days with? And then finally, in the evening, pray gratitude. You know, we tend to litter our dinner tables with the leftovers from the day. Right, we carry our day home with us. Not because we want to, we just do. So what if instead of spending your commute home stewing over that one unpleasant conversation or, or, or planning on how you're gonna handle that situation or wishing you had gotten more done on your to-do list than you actually did, you simply found a seat on the max or you gripped the steering wheel of your car or you began to pedal your bike and as you did, you recounted everything that you could think of to be grateful to God from this day. Morris West says there's a certain point in the spiritual journey when our prayer life gets summarized mainly just to these three phrases, thank you, thank you, thank you. So what if you began to litter your home or your dinner table not with the day's leftovers but with the fruit of the Spirit instead? Look, I'm not inviting you to an innovative idea here. I'm inviting you to pray like Jesus prayed and to pray like those who got closest to him kept on praying, to pray like the church prayed at first and to pray the way that the church has tragically forgotten. 